بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار uh, we start today in charah the uh, 12th hadith hadith number 12 in an-nawawi's 40 hadith and this hadith is the is is that reported by Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu and the text of the hadith is as follows an Abi Huraira radiyallahu anhu qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min husni min husni islam al-mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni and this hadith is hadith hasan reported by At-Tirmidhi and others so inshallah we're going to go through the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthameen, rahimahullah, first. This is a very uh, very short explanation. Uh, it's, uh, and then after that, we'll go on to the explanation of Sheikh Salih al Sheikh. So, Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, rahimahullah, he first of all uh, begins by mentioning the uh, some grammatical, uh, a little grammatical principle, which is that here in this in this hadith, uh, it's uh, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam has basically changed the noun and the predicate. Just a grammatical thing. So normally it would read, um, it would uh, it, it would read, "Tarkuhu uh, ma yani min husne Islam al mar'i," which is which uh, is describing. Uh, a subject and then its predicate. Obviously, this is a technical matter. We won't go into too much detail. But we find that in this in this hadith, it's actually been put the other way around. So the predicate has been brought to the front of the sentence, and the subject has been brought to the end of the sentence. So in in Arabic, they call it khabrun muqaddamun and mubtadaun muakharun. So anyway, we won't delve into that for, for too much. Uh, the Sheikh then says. That when the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ma la yani, which is that which does not concern him. Sorry, I forgot to give the translation. Translation is that Abu Hurairah, Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu anhu, he said that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, from the excellent, from the excellence of of the Islam of a man, is that he leaves that which does not concern him. From the excellence of the Islam of a man is that he leaves that which does not concern him. So, uh, after mentioning this grammatical issue in regards to how the sentence is constructed, in that the predicate has been brought forward and the subject has been delayed, uh, the Sheikh then says, commenting, مَا لَا meaning the, the part in the sentence which says that which does not concern him, meaning that which, you know, which isn't something that should occupy his mind or which should be of his concern and this hadith is very similar to another hadith in which the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhir falyaqul khairan aw liyasmut that whoever believes in allah and the last day then either let him say that which is good let him say goodness that which is good or let him remain silent so the Sheikh says that when we look at these two hadith, they kind of resemble each other from certain angles. They have a similarity from certain angles. Then the Sheikh goes on to list some of the benefits of this hadith. So he says that from the benefits of this hadith, from the benefits of this hadith is number one that Islam is something that when we look at Islam, it is something that gathers together all of the good qualities, all of the excellent qualities. Islam is something that brings together all of the most excellent qualities. And the Sheikh says that his Sheikh, meaning the teacher of Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al-Uthaymeen, which is the Sheikh Abdurrahman bin Nasr al-Sa'di, 
Rahimahullah, another great Shaykh from, from our times, uh, he said that this Shaykh that he wrote a book, or some, he, he wrote something on the subject called Mahasinuddin al Islami, meaning the excellent qualities of the Islamic religion. And likewise, he says that the Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Muhammad bin Salman, Rahimahullah, that he likewise wrote uh, uh, something on this subject as well. And when we look at the excellent, the mahasin, the excellent qualities or the, uh, the characteristics of Islam, we find that they are combined under two words. There are two words under which all of the good qualities of Islam come under. And this is mentioned in the verse in which Allah, the mighty and majestic, he says, "Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan." So indeed, Allah He commands with al adl, which is justice, and al ihsan, which is benevolence or the doing of good. Benevolence or the doing of good. The Surah Al Nahl, Surah 16, verse 90. So all of those excellent qualities of Islam, or those qualities that Islam commends and tries to build and inculcate amongst the people, then all of these come under these two words, Al-Adl Wal-Ihsan. The, the, the fact that Allah has commanded Al-Adl, which is justice, and Al-Ihsan, which is benevolence. So the first benefit is that Islam, when we look at Islam, it brings together all of the excellent qualities and characteristics. And this is something that we gather uh, from this hadith. Second, benefit that the Shaykh mentions is uh, that the fact that a person he abandons and leaves those things which are, are of no concern to him they've got no connection to his affairs and they've got no connection to his needs whatever his needs are those affairs which have got, which have got no connection at all to these issues that when he leaves them then this is from the excellence of his Islam that represents and shows that he has something, so he doesn't just have Islam, he has the excellence of Islam. Right? This is a quality that, that, that is from the excellence of Islam. The third benefit from this uh, hadith is that any person who preoccupies himself or is busy with those things that don't concern him, Right? They, they, they don't really relate to him, they don't really concern him, then that is a proof to show that his Islam is not excellent. Right? He doesn't have this attribute of excellency in his Islam. And the Shaykh says, you find this often in many people. You'll find this often in many people. Uh, you know, you'll see that some of these people, they'll start speaking about things that have got no connection to them don't really concern them they or they might come to another person start asking him <coughs> about certain things which again have got no connection to him they start entering into affairs which again have got no concern with, with that person and all of this when we see people behave uh, involved in this behavior then this is a proof to show that these people that in their Islam they don't have the quality of excellence they don't have this quality of excellence in in their Islam the next benefit, the fourth benefit the Shaykh mentions is uh, from this hadith is that it's desirable and recommended and desirable for a person that he tries to, that since we know that Islam has many excellent qualities that it tries to develop in the people, then a, pers then a person should try to seek out these qualities and to, to, to develop, develop them. And he should abandon those things which don't really concern him he should just relax and keep away from those things because if he was to get involved in those things which don't concern him, then he would just tie himself. He would just involve himself and busy himself and just tie himself out in those issues. And now the Sheikh says there's, a, there's a, a question which arises at this point. There's an issue that arises at this point which needs to be clarified, uh, which is that... When we speak of this issue that a person should not be involved in those things that don't concern him, how does this relate to the issue of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil? Now, how does it relate to this issue and how can we reconcile between the two separate issues? The Sheikh says that this hadith and what it, what it is saying, 
that a man shouldn't be concerned with those things that are of no con- you know that have not got any connection or, or concern to him this does not apply to enjoining the good and forbidding the evil well, that's an exception it does, doesn't apply to al amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil anil munkar and the shaykh then brings an ayah from the quran in surah ali imran the third surah verse 104 wal takum minkum ummatun ummatun yad'una ila al khayr wa ya'muruna bil ma'ruf wa yanhawna anil munkar that let there arise from you a band of people who invite to to to, to, to the goodness and who who enjoin that which is good and who prohibit that which is evil so for example if one of us was to see or if a person was to see an evil and you know a person sees someone else doing some evil and then you say to that person oh my brother this is this is munkar this is evil it's not permissible then if that per- that person has no right to say that what I'm doing is of no concern to you. You mind your own business. It doesn't concern you. Just leave it alone and just mind your own business. Right? This is this is something that is wrong. Obviously, this is some, this is something that is wrong. And if a person was to say this, then it wouldn't be accepted. Like for example, if we see a person, you know, maybe he's falling into some sin or some maybe you know he's smoking or maybe he's falling into some gambling, and he gets advised, and then it's not it's not his right in any form or fashion to say, well, you know what? This has got no concern. Of, it's no concern of yours. You mind your own business. It doesn't concern you. Don't get involved in it. It's got nothing to do with you, and it's 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 my business. This is wrong. This is wrong. This 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 is not right. And we can't use this hadith to apply to that situation. That's wrong, because the issue of enjoining good and forbidding evil is a separate issue and a separate topic, which 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 you know which 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 overrides this particular issue here. So the point being. Uh, that enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, this concerns all of the Muslim Ummah. It's a concern of the entire Muslim Ummah, everybody. It's everybody's concern. And uh, this, this also applies to <coughs> a person and his family and his sons and his daughters. And because he is the shepherd of the house and, you know, he... He directs them towards goodness and he commands them with goodness and he warns them from the evil and he prohibits them from the evil. Then this is something that, you know, is, is, is something that directly concerns each and every single person. And then he, the Shaykh brings the verse uh, that Allah, in which Allah, the mighty majestic, says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, u anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, wa quduha al-nasu wal hijar. That, oh, uh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. So that's the end of the Sheikh's explanation. It's a brief explanation. And uh, that's an uh, extremely uh, beneficial point in that this hadith, even, it, even though it uh, advises a man not to be concerned with that which doesn't concern him directly, that this obviously doesn't apply to enjoining the good and forbidding uh, the evil. So we move on now to the explanation of Sheikh Zalih al Sheikh, So he begins by mentioning the hadith and he says uh, Islam that from the excellence of, a, of, a, of, a, of the Islam of a man is for him to abandon that which does not concern him. So he says this hadith is also from those hadith that some of the people of knowledge have said that you know it is it is from the usul of al adab right from the from the from the pillars and the foundations of the subject of manners islamic manners if we remember earlier in in these lessons when we looked at the first few ahadith you remember that the hadith of the intention the hadith of uh, the halal and the haram and the hadith of the, uh, the the Aisha, the Hadith of uh, anything which is anyone who does an action which is not from uh, this affair will have it rejected. We see that how some of the scholars they said that these are Hadith, these three are Hadith, and some of them add a fourth are Hadith, that these are from the usul of the religion, foundations of the religion. This Hadith, when we look at the works of the scholars, they say that this Hadith along with others 
are the foundation of al-adab, right? The issue of manners, the, the Islamic mannerisms, and this hadith is one of the hadith which is the which which are from the foundations of the usul or the principles that relate to Islamic mannerisms, the person's adab, his behavior, his characteristic characteristics, and so on and so forth, and how he deals with other people and with other things. Now, this hadith is from the usul of that particular uh, subject. Um, so. The Shaykh says that, that, as we've seen and as we've mentioned in these lessons, that Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah, that when we look at the, the a hadith that he's chosen in this book, he's chosen a hadith, he's chosen the most concise and relevant a hadith that relate to different subjects, all different subjects, but he's chosen the, you know, he, he's chosen like hadith which form the foundations in those subjects, right? So for example, in the, 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 the hadith of actions, he's, he's put the hadith of niyyah, the hadith of intentions. In the hadith of, you know, the actions being accepted as far as physically and practically how they're done, he's brought the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. In the halal and haram, he's brought the issue of the halal is bayin and the haram is bayin. So he, when we look at all the different subjects, he's, we find that he's brought hadith from the sunnah which, are, which contain the foundations of those subjects that he is actually mentioning. And so here, Imam al-Nawi, rahimahullah, he mentions the hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, min husni islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'nih, that from the excellence of a man, from the excellent Islam of a man, is his abandoning that which does not concern him. So the Shaykh says, first of all, because the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used the particle min, Min husni islam il mar'i that from the excellence of the Islam of a man, this shows that this thing that we are speaking of, meaning the excellence of Islam, the the the, the ihsanul Islam or the husn al Islam, the excellence of, of, of Islam, that this is something which is tabiidiyah. It's something that uh, you know it, it has parts. It is it is composed of parts, and there are many things. There are many different things, many different qualities, many different characteristics which make up the excellence of a person's Islam. And this thing, this characteristic mentioned in this hadith is one of those such things, which is that a person leaves and abandons that which does not uh, concern him. Which, which also means that if a person was to leave those things that do not concern him, that this would make up one element or one part of the excellence of his of his Islam. And the Shaykh says that this is something that's clearly evident from, from the language because obviously the particle min bin husni Islam in Mar'i has been used and this proves that the excellence of Islam is something that is is you know has has parts and can be broken down into different qualities and characteristics. Then he says uh, that he says that in this hadith, a messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Husni Islam al Mar'i, Husni Islam al Mar'i," and he says that when we look at this hadith and many other hadith, we f we find that when we, when we put all these <coughs> hadith together, we find that this issue of the excellence of Islam, Hasan al Islam or Husni al Islam, we find. That this occurs in numerous other hadith as well, not just this hadith. Then the Shaykh gives us a proof. He says, let's look at another hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا أَحْسَنَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِسْلَامَهُ كَانَ لَهُ بِكُلِّ حَسَنَةٍ يَعْمَلُهَا عَشْرَ حَسَنَاتٍ إِلَى سَبْئِ مِيَا دَعْفٍ وَإِذَا عَمْلَ بِسَيِّئَةٍ كَانَتْ سَيِّئَةٍ بِمِثْلِهَا the meaning of which is that when one of you, uh, ahsana, uh, when one of you uh, is excellent in his <coughs> Islam, that meaning that in his practice of Islam that he shows excellence, then he will have for every good deed he does from ten rewards to seven hundred multiples, from to seven hundred times over. And when he does an evil deed, he will have the sin of just one evil deed. 
in this hadith we can see clearly that the messenger said when one of you إِذَا أَحْسَنَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِسْلَامَهُ that when one of you <coughs> is excellent in his Islam so at the beginning he mentioned the excellence of Islam that a man implements in his behavior in, in his practice of Islam and then the messenger went on to explain the varying degrees of reward so because he said that it is from 10 times the good deed to 700 times over that itself proves that this excellence in Islam is something that can be broken down into component parts it has degrees, it has levels, it has ranks and therefore it, it will be rewarded to different degrees and different levels to, for, for different people so this is another proof to show that that when we speak of the excellence of Islam that it composed, uh, it, it, that when we're speaking of this thing uh, 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 that, that we call the excellence in a person's Islam that is something that it is something that can be broken down it has parts, levels, degrees and it has rewards for it that, that, that will vary in fact it's just like Islam as a whole Islam as a whole is composed of many actions, many statements and so we see the pillars of Islam and we see other actions from Islam and that's what Islam as a whole is composed of and likewise when we're speaking of the excellence in a person's implementation of Islam then that too, this excellence, that too is something that has characteristics, qualities, parts to it and which again it can admit to different levels of rewards uh, in different people so it's like a similar thing and then the shaykh goes on to mention that he goes on now to discuss an issue which is at what point or which Muslim can, about, can we say that this person has the excellence of Islam? At what point can we say that a person is now described with the quality of the excellence of Islam? Not just Islam, the basic Islam, but the excellence of Islam. At what point does this actually occur? So the Shaykh says that the scholars have different views. There are different views on this. And the, sh the Shaykh mentions uh, two ways of looking at the situation. <coughs> Two ways of looking at the situation. He says the first group, they said that when we speak of Ihsanul Islam, which is the excellence of Islam, this is when a person, he does the wajibat, he does the, all of the obligatory deeds, and he keeps away from the muharramat, he keeps away from those things which are unlawful. And he says that this is the level of the muqtasideen, the muqtasideen. And this is a verse mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah mentions in the Quran, the mighty majestic, in Surah Al-Fatir, the 35th Surah, verse 32, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا فَمِنْهُمْ ذَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخِيرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ This is a verse in which Allah says, Then we made to inherit the book those whom we chose from our servants. So amongst them, is the one who wrongs his own soul and amongst them is the one who is muqtasid in a middle path and amongst them is the one who is foremost in doing good deeds and this verse the scholars have used this verse to, to, to separate the Muslims into three categories of people the first of them ظالمٌ لنفسه the one who wrongs his own soul they say that this is a person who falls short in the obligatory duties and he falls into some of the sins, some or more of the sins. This is a person who wrongs his own soul. That's the first level of, 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 of a Muslim. He does not fulfill all his obligations and likewise he falls into sins. And that's the person referred to in this verse, ذَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ And then Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسِدْ Amongst them is the one who is in the middle cause. And the scholars say that this refers to a person who does all of the good deeds, <coughs> sorry, who he does all of the obligatory deeds, those things which are wajib, and he keeps away from all of the things which are prohibited. And in addition to that, he may do something of the nawafil, something of the non-obligatory, the voluntary deeds. That's the person who is the muqtasid. And the third category, sabikum bil khairat, are those who do the wajibat, to keep away from the muharramat, and they excel in doing all of the or you know, the, the nawafil, the, the voluntary deeds, they excel in doing that, seeking the pleasure of Allah the Most High. So here the Shaykh says that 
the people about whom we can say that they have Ihsanul Islam are those who are from this, the, the second, from the Muqtasid and upwards. Right? They are the ones about whom we can say that, they, that in their Islam they are displaying excellence or they are showing excellence in their Islam. So the Muqtasid, the one who does the wajibat, keeps away from those which the, the haram things and he may do something of the, of the nawafil along with that. Right, so this this is a person about who, whom we can say this person has an, you know has excellence in his Islam, um, and you know so this per, this person and above that level, the Sheikh says this is the view of one group of scholars, but there's also another view and another angle, and they say that another way to look at it is from the Hadith of uh, Jibril. Alayhi salam, in which he mentions the levels of ibadah, where he mentions Islam and then Iman and then Ihsan. Right? So Islam being when a person just does the outward deeds. We all, all we see from this person is just the outward physical uh, deeds like the shahada and the prayer and uh, you know the zakah, hajj and so on and so forth. And then we have Iman, which is the inward, that which is inward, and then we have Ihsan. So another way to look at the situation is that the, that the scholars say that Ihsan is, as is mentioned in the Hadith of Jibreel, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يراك. That you worship Allah as though you are seeing Him, and even though you don't see Him, then surely He indeed sees you. So, they, so these, this group of scholars say that a person who can be said to have excellence in his Islam, is the one who fits this characteristic, which is the one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he can see Allah, and even though Allah, even though he can't see Allah, then Allah indeed uh, sees him. And the Shaykh explains that this level of Ihsan itself is broken down into two further levels that he mentions Al Muraqaba and Al Mushahada. We won't go into that in too much detail. Uh, but the, the Shaykh says that. Uh, the Sheikh then goes on to clarify that whichever way we look at whichever way we look at this issue, meaning whichever way we whichever angle we come from, in order to understand when we can say about a person that he has excellence in his Islam, it doesn't matter which way, whether we look at it from this way or whether we look at it from that way, whether we look at it from the point of view of the verse that we mentioned in Surah Fatir or whether we look at it from the point of view of this hadith, in the hadith of Jibreel, the shaykh says, nevertheless, what we learn is that the excellence of a person's Islam isn't just a single level. Isn't just something that we can say, yes, this person has excellence of Islam, or no, this person doesn't have excellence of Islam. Rather, it is something which varies in its degrees, and that each person will vary in the degree and the level to which a person has excellence in his Islam. This all depends upon, obviously, his um, you know, actions that he performs and so on and so forth. The Shaykh then comes back to the hadith that you, that you mentioned earlier, which is the hadith in which the Messenger says that when one of you uh, does excellence in his Islam, the one who, meaning the one who makes his Islam to be excellent, then he will have for every good deed from from ten rewards to seven hundred rewards, right? So the, the Sheikh says here that we start from ten, and ten is for everybody who does good deeds, right? The Sheikh says uh, the, 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 the ten is for everybody, every Muslim who does good deeds, and from that point onwards it multiplies upwards up until it reaches seven hundred. Right, so how much a person will, will get rewarded will depend upon the level and state of the excellence of his Islam. The more excellent in his Islam of the, that a person is, then he will get more rewards for each of his good deeds. Right. So, so in other words, the point, the, the understanding of the message here is that different people get rewarded different amounts. It might be for the same deeds. Right? But different people receive different rewards 
even though they may be doing the same actions. And what determines how much they get, how much they get rewarded is the general excellence in the practice of their Islam. Right? So the more excellent excellence a person shows in his practice of Islam and in which you know he he like for example he shows these characteristics like the characteristic in this hadith that he abandons that which does not concern him and all other things and the more all round excellence a person shows in his Islam then he will be receiving higher multiples of reward for each and every single one of his actions. Right? So in other words in other words the more excellent you make your Islam then your rewards become multiplied you know, exponentially. Right? So instead of getting 10 rewards, you're now getting <coughs> 50, 100, 150, 100, 200 times more than what you would get for just the base level of doing a good deed. And this is what is meant. This is what he meant. And uh, so in other words, when we look at the people who fall into the category of al you know, those who have the excellence in their Islam, which means anyone who does not fall into the category of the one who wrongs his own soul, anyone who is muqtasid or above, right? Then amongst this group of people, they will vary amongst each other in terms of how much they are getting rewarded for their, for their deeds. And they will vary from 10 to 700. And the most excellent of people in their Islam will be receiving 700 multiples for each and every single deed, for every deed that they do. The Shaykh says, this is why Ibn Abbas anhuma, and others from the Mufassireen, this is why they said that the, that the reward being multiplied by 10 is for everybody. That's for any person that does a good deed, for every Muslim. But as for the, and this is what occurs in the Quran, man ja'a bil hasanati, فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا That anyone who, who brings a good deed, then he will have ten times its like. So this is a, we can see clearly, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ Anyone who comes with a good deed. So we can see clearly, this is for everybody. It's for everybody. This, this applies to everybody. As for the one who shows excellence in his Islam, and who develops those char- characteristics which are from the excellence of Islam, then there's another verse about that, and that, this is uh, the, the verse in which Allah says, وَإِن تَقُوا حَسَنَةً وَإِن تَقُوا حَسَنَةً يُدَاعِفْ يُدَاعِفْهَا وَيُؤْتِ مِنْ لَدُنْهُ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Then if there is a good deed, uh, then Allah will multiply it, and will give for it, will give from Himself a great and mighty reward. Right, so this applies to you know, that which is above and beyond the multiple of ten for each and every every deed. So the Shaykh says that we find that when we look at the, even though this is discussed in the books of the scholars and in the works of the scholars, we find that this is something that is, um, is discussed in the various books and the scholars have clarified that Ihsan, that this issue of the excellence of Islam has levels and degrees and it's not just one fixed level for everybody and also the fact that anyone who falls into sins anyone who falls you know who falls short in the actions of dis- the, the, the actions of obedience which are wajib and he falls habitually into the actions which are sin then this person cannot to, can, cannot be from those who have the excellence of islam and so therefore this person is losing a great deal of reward you know he's losing if you work it out you know He's losing anything up to multiples of 700 of reward for each and every single one of his deeds. Why? Because of the level of or, or, or his rank and his, and his level. So he's losing a great deal of reward and he's depriving himself of a great deal of a reward. And then the Sheikh goes on to say that once we understand this, we can then now move on to... What is actually meant in the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Ma la ya'ni. Ma la ya'ni. In the, in the hadith it says that a person leaves that which is of no concern to him. Tarquhu ma la ya'ni. So exactly, so what does this mean? And what are those things that a person should not be concerned with? We need to, obviously we need, to, we need this clarified. The Sheikh says 
that the meaning of inaya, inaya, this word, uh, it means shiddatul ihtimam bishay, or shay al muhim aladhi yuhtamu bihi, which means that when a person has a, a severe concern with something, he's occupied and severely concerned with something, and or it is some or it is an important thing about which a person should be concerned, an important thing about which some, about which a person should be uh, concerned. And then the sheikh says, as for the as for that thing which which doesn't which which you know which 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 shouldn't doesn't have any concern, then it is that thing which doesn't benefit a person. It is that thing which doesn't benefit a person. Those things that don't benefit a person in any form or fashion. Uh, the Sheikh says that if a person was to turn to them and address them, it wouldn't benefit him in anything. There wouldn't be any rectification for him in those things. There wouldn't be any benefit for him in those things. Um, and so this is what is meant. When he, when he says, Tarkuhu mala ya'nih, it means something which is not worthy of being addressed or worthy of being occupied with and which in itself doesn't provide any benefit to the person who occupies himself with that thing. And the Sheikh says, we know that all of the affairs in the Sharia, everything in the Sharia, that a Muslim, <coughs> that a Muslim, obviously he has concern with those affairs because those affairs are affairs which directly benefit him. Such as, for example, understanding the Quran, understanding the Sunnah, then no doubt every Muslim should have a concern and should be occupied in those things because they have direct benefit in those things. But outside of that, there are many other things which are of no benefit to him. They, they, they don't have any self-importance such that a person should be occupied with them and nor, nor will they bring about any benefit if a person was to, was to you know, get involved in those affairs. So, uh, <coughs> the point being, or the meaning here, that anything in which, any, when a person is, is concerned with those things, which help him to get an understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that when a man occupies himself in those things, this itself is a proof to show the excellence of his Islam. Right? So in other words, when a man is occupied in understanding the book and the Sunnah and gaining fiqh of, of the religion, then this is a proof to show the excellence of a person's Islam. And the Sheikh says, when we look at this hadith, we can derive the opposite meaning. So for example, the messenger said, from the excellent Islam of a person is him abandoning that which does not concern him. Right? But the other meaning also applies, which would be that from the excellent Islam of a person is for him to be occupied in that which does concern him. Which in this case is understanding the religion, understanding the book, and, 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 and the sunnah. This is very similar to another hadith in which the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said that to whomever Allah wishes to show goodness, he will give him understanding of the religion. And the scholars have said that the opposite meaning also applies, that to whomever Allah intends evil, he will not grant him understanding of the religion. Right? So same thing in this hadith, that just like a person abandons that which doesn't concern him, and this is from his excellent Islam, then likewise that a person is involved with and concerned with which that will that, that does concern him, then that is for likewise from the excellence of his uh, Islam. So the Sheikh says that this issue, uh, you know, when we see, when we look at those things that don't concern a Muslim, then this applies to the, you know, the statements, the statements, those statements in which there's no benefit for him or benefit in the religion, and nor in his worldly affairs. There's no benefit him in pursuing those statements or making those statements or listening to those statements in which there's no benefit either in the religion or in the worldly affairs or in the hereafter. And if he abandons those things, then that is from the excellence of his of Islam. The Sheikh says that this principle applies to everything. It applies to every type of knowledge. The excess or the superfluous knowledge of which there is no benefit to a person. It applies to all types of knowledge. Likewise, it applies to all types of mu'amalat. Those dealings and interactions that a person has. Those dealings 
interactions with people which are no benefit to him. There are absolutely no benefit to him in any form or fashion to have dealings with such people. Or ilaqat, or these kind of attachments, associations, applies to that as well. Being involved in attachments, associations with people in which there is no benefit to you in your religion or in your worldly life. And, you know, this applies. So in other words, this hadith, when it mentions uh, to leave that which does not concern him, then this applies to statements, it applies to the dealings that people have amongst each other, and it applies to, you know, the attachments and associations that people, people have. So that a person leaves these affairs is something which represents the excellence of his uh, Islam. And this, the, what does it mean? It shows that this person, it shows that he has a proof. It, it shows that there is proof in this person to show that he uh, desires goodness, that he is hoping towards goodness. So he doesn't want his time wasted in all of these issues. He doesn't want his you know, uh, time being used up and wasted in these non-beneficial things. And that proves that he has this aspire and this, uh, this aspiration and this uh, uh, desire to seek only that which is, which is good. Why? Because this person recognizes and realizes that all of these associations, all of these dealings, all of these statements that he either makes himself or that he hears, or these statements that he hears, that when he gets involved in them, they are a means and a method and an avenue through which he is then led to other things which are haram and which are unlawful and which you know which which you know which will make him either to be neglectful in his obligatory duties or will make him fall or will make him fall into the sinful uh, matters right so these superfluous these additional extra non beneficial things that don't concern him by in, by indulging in them he makes himself open up to or, or opened up towards other things that will you know make him fall into sin or make him fall short into in the into the uh, wajibat in into the obligatory affair, affairs which are obligatory upon him and so as a result of this what does this mean this means that now he is making himself fall from the level of the muqtasidin to the dhalibun li nafsih to the one who wrongs his own soul and as a result of that he is he's making him himself lose a great deal of reward. So whereas he would have got multiple times more reward for every single deed that he does, he's now reducing that multiple right down to the average, to the basic standard, you know, to the to the ten. Right? So but so you can see why this is important that a person he he looks very carefully at the things that he's occupied with, the things that he's involved with and how that is then an avenue for him to fall into disobedience, to fall short in his wajibat and to fall into sin, and thereby as a result completely slash the multiples and the amounts of reward that he would otherwise get. Right? So this showed, you can see why, why this, 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 this is obviously very, very uh, important for a Muslim to consider these affairs and make sure that he always maintains the base level of the excellence of Islam, in order to maintain the, 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 the huge amounts of, of uh, rewards. Then the Sheikh goes on to explain uh, the Sheikh goes on to explain other things that the uh, that the scholars have mentioned regarding this hadith. He says that the scholars when they discuss this hadith and they speak about the speech, they speak about you know the speech that doesn't concern a person, this refers to either making the speech or it refers to hearing the speech both things so you don't speak about things that don't concern you nor do you listen to things or open up your ears to things that are of no benefit and no concern to you the sheikh says uh, uh, whether whether the speech is spoken or whether it is heard then it is it is kalam and so therefore the, the, the sheikh says that when the scholars they make when they explain this hadith they say that from the excellence of the Islam of a person is to abandon that which doesn't concern him in terms of speech, whether it's heard or whether it's spoken by himself. Both. And the Shaykh says, obviously, this is very clear. This is very apparent because the tongue is the source of where many, many slips and mistakes occur. 
And likewise the ears in what they hear, it is a source of where, where very many slips and mistakes are, are made. And the Shaykh says that, this, that the tongue, when a person speaks with it, then it is something for which a person will be held to account. And the Shaykh brings an ayah from the Quran, مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ that never does he utter a, 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 a word except that uh, alongside him is a right, is one that a scribe that writes it, writes it down. And the Shaykh says th this verse is general and the angel writes down every single thing, even those things for which you would not necessarily be held to account for, even those things for which you won't get punished, you won't be held to account, the angel even writes those things. The Shaykh was on to mention some statements from the Salaf who said that the angel writes down every single thing even the moaning and the groaning of an ill person. person who is ill and he groans, he moans due to the pain, whatever, even that will be written down. Even though we know that that person won't, won't be held to account, he won't be called to account for, for that speech and for, 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 the, for those things. Nevertheless, it is still written down. And the Shaykh says that this is the correct view, the stronger view, that the angel in fact writes down every single thing. And the angel isn't concerned with, well, is this thing rewardable? Is this thing punishable? Is this thing neither of the two? The angel doesn't distinguish. The angel has been commanded to write, and the angel writes down every single thing. The, the Shaykh says there's two proofs for this. And there are two evidences for this. The first evidence is the fact that Allah said in this verse, uh, that never does he utter a word and the shaykh says in this hadith we see that the negation that the negation has come again this is a grammatical rule uh, that whenever we see a negation of something in Arabic and this negation is made where the noun is an, in the indefinite form indefinite form then this means that this is a general unrestricted negation it applies to all things and all instances of that of that thing being negated so therefore this means uh, that this applies to everything 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 and every speech meaning any statement that is mentioned it will be written down this is the first proof directly from the verse the second proof <coughs> is that uh, that any person who claims that the angel that that that, that the angel um, that the angel you know uh, that what the angel writes down is broken down into that which is a reward and that which is rewarded that which is punished the sheikh says that any person who makes this claim then they need to bring proof to show that the angel that is writing those things down that the angel has the ability to distinguish between those things in which there is a reward and those things for which there is a punishment and also to distinguish between the intentions inside the people's hearts and the actions of the people's hearts because obviously outwardly a statement might be a good deed but if the person's intention is wrong that isn't a good deed it's an evil deed right so the angel must have that knowledge and that ability to distinguish all of these affairs in a person, in the, in the things that a person does, or in the statements a person person writes. So anyone who makes that claim that the angel distinguishes and knows between the right and the wrong, and the angel writes down the right and the wrong, then they have to bring proof to show that the angel has that criterion, has that knowledge, has that understanding, in order to classify and to make judgments upon actions as to whether they are good or whether they are evil. And... Uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi, rahimahullah, he mentions in his book, Kitab al-Iman, that this does not have any evidence. There is no evidence to say that this is the case. Namely, that the angel knows those things that are rewarded and knows those things which are not rewarded. But the angel is only one that writes. That's all the angel does. The angel has been commanded to write and to record, and that is exactly what it does. Allah says in the Quran, أَمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّا لَسْمَعُوا سِرَّهُمْ وَنَجْوَاهُمْ بَلَا وَرُسُلُنَا وَرُسُلُنَا لَدَيْهِمْ يَكْتُبُونَ Do they think that we do not hear their private counsels you know, and their secret counsels? Rather, our angels are with them 
writing down. And Allah says in another verse, Kiraman Qatibin, that noble honored angels that write down. Then other, there are many other, other verses as well. What, do all, what does all this show? This shows that um, all of this discussion, what does it show? It shows that those things which do not concern a person, whether it is making statements or whether it is hearing statements, then all of that is from the excellence of the Islam of a person. And it is something by which a servant's rank and level is increased higher and higher. And obviously, the multiple by which his good deeds are rewarded, likewise increases along uh, with that. And then the Shaykh goes on to bring another verse. لا خير في كثير من أجواهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين الناس. That there is no goodness in many of their private gatherings except for the one who ordered with charity or with goodness or who rectified between uh, the people. And the Sheikh says uh, that this this is why that from this hadith that we are discussing uh, that what is intended by this hadith that it applies to speech. Whether it's made or whether it's heard. It applies to both things. And that's why that when we look at the meaning of this hadith, it applies to the following situations. Like for example, when you start inquiring and investigating into things which are of no concern to you. Or which are of no concern to you in your religion. Or for example, when you are eager to start knowing certain information or certain news. Right? The news about so-and-so, so-and-so situation. Or, where does this person work? Or, how did he do? Or, what did he say? Or, what did he do? Or, how is his relationship with so-and-so person? Or, you know, what information do you have about such and such? Right? Mm -hmm. Or, what are the people doing? What are the people involved in? And, you know, like all of these kind of things that people, when they meet each other, they ask about this, and they ask about that, and they talk about this, and they talk about that. All these issues. Then, this enters into this hadith. Right? This enters into this hadith. To, you know, to <coughs> abandon... That which doesn't actually concern you, of no concern to you, no benefit to you. So to be concerned with these things which are of no benefit, of no concern, then this is something that opposes this quality and this characteristic or this trait of the excellence of uh, Islam. And again, the proof that a person has excellence of Islam is that he leaves this superfluous, additional, you know, not necess unnecessary. Uh, statements and you know whether a person makes a statement or whether a person hears uh, the statements. Therefore, the Sheikh says this hadith is from the great hadith that speak about the adab, the mannerisms, and you know the, the, the those adab which are obligatory upon us that you know that we that we try to act upon these hadith. Why? Because they are from the ihsanul Islam, from the excellence of Islam. And because there's a great deal of excellence in them, and you know, this applies to speech, whether you hear the speech, whether you make the speech, and likewise actions, relationships, associations, interactions with people, dealings with people, it applies across the world to all of these uh, different things. And uh, you know, those things in which there's no need, you know, there's no, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's no need for entering into certain issues, like the Sheikh goes on to mention again about inquiring to certain things and gathering the news about the people. And this person did that, this person said that, this person abandoned this, this person went there, this person went here, this person. You no, know, the Sheikh is just saying that these are the kind of things that people in their speeches, this is what they, what they, what, what they're involved in. And not only that, but likewise to start speaking about these things and narrating these things and opening up the door, you know, into this whole subject and topic area. All of this is something that takes a person away further and further and further and further away from the quality of the excellence of his Islam. That's why the Sheikh says that this hadith is indeed an absolutely, this is like a great mighty wasiyah, a great piece of advice regarding the issue of al-adab, you know, the mannerisms, you know, and this is from the, this is from the, uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That, are, that from the excellent Islam of a person, that he abandons that which does not concern him. Uh, and that which doesn't concern him in his religion. And that which doesn't concern him in the affairs of his worldly affairs either. In his statements or in that which he hears or, and so on and so forth. So therefore, in conclusion, 
we find that in this short sentence, when you look at this short sentence, you find that there is a great, mighty, beneficial, righteous effect upon the heart of a person. Meaning, meaning that it helps a person to rectify his heart, it helps a person to rectify his actions. And we see, the Sheikh says that what people don't realize is that often people, when they are, you know, when they are misled or when they fall into that which is not befitting, then it's often from this angle. Often from this angle, from the angle of what they are hearing or from the angle of what they are speaking. That when they indulge in this, it gradually takes them away from the level of the excellence of Islam as a result of which they put themselves at a disadvantage in terms of the reward and, and so on and so forth and then opening themselves up to falling into sin or falling short in doing the, the wajib affairs by entering into these issues. Uh, the Sheikh says this is why the Salaf, some of the Salaf they used to say they used to say about certain people who used to speak a lot and they used to you know uh, speak a lot and uh, would increase in their speech and narrations and whatever he would say that these people action has become uh, difficult upon them you know it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that they've got tired of, they've, they've got tired of doing actions and therefore they're just indulging in, in speech so they increased in their speech you know hearing and making it and as a result of this they got taken away from action action became a burden upon them and they got taken away from that and this is a blameworthy characteristic in the sense that we speak a great deal without any actions. We sit in gatherings, long, long gatherings. We speak about many, many different things. We spend an hour, two hours, three hours in speech that we, that we make, which is of no benefit. And in fact, it is harmful. And on the other hand, we find that the obligatory things that are, are obligatory upon us, they are very many. And... You know, instead of a person seeking out the obligatory things, we find a person doing lots of the mubah things, those things which are permissible, those things which neither bring reward nor bring benefit. So as a result of that, he's being taken away from the more beneficial obligatory uh, things. This is from the traps of Iblis, that he, makes a per that he occupies a person away from the wajib things, those which, the things are which, in which there is a reward, to doing only those things which are mubah, meaning which don't involve any sin. So a person reasons in his mind, well, I'm not committing any sin, so no problem. But shaitan traps him and takes him away by way of that reasoning from the beneficial, rewardable uh, things. So that's why the shaykh says, uh, and sometimes even these things he falls into, they, might, they may even be haram in those things in terms of the statements or in, or in terms of the actions. So the point being is that the Sheikh says that all of this is not from the characteristic characteristics of a student of knowledge, a student of knowledge and a person who pursues knowledge, then he is someone who is always being careful in his actions and is always looking for that thing which will benefit him, uh, which will benefit him you know, in, in, in those things in which the Sharia has commanded him or recommended him and the, the student of knowledge abandons those things which have no benefit to him in the statements and actions, whether they are internal and external. And then the Sheikh just finishes off by a short discussion on the ruling or the status of this hadith. He says this hadith, uh, well, just to summarize, that the scholars, when they look at the chain of narration of this hadith, they say that the chain of narration is actually mursal, and however, due to supporting evidence, due to the fact that there are other evidences and supporting witnesses for this hadith, the hadith is actually hasan ligayrihi, just meaning that the hadith is supported by other texts uh, and other, other narrations and so therefore the ruling of this hadith is that it is Hassan uh, so the shaykh finishes on that note and with that we finish the discussion of this hadith uh, and so we'll conclude our lesson at this point and inshallah ta'ala will continue with the next hadith which is hadith number uh, 13 which is that none of you truly believes up until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. So inshallah that will be the subject of next hadith and with that we conclude today's lesson. Barak lafik. Inshallah, inshallah.